I'm all for truth, justice, and the revolutionary American way. It seems like we spend a lot of time discussing whether or not we should be proud of America or whether supporting the troops abroad and at home means supporting the idiotic and unconstitutional government that placed them there. We witness and sometimes participate in artificial morality plays when we try to determine if the government murder of some people is okay and whether government torture under some circumstances is ethical. George W. Bush, uh, speaking for the government, has repeatedly said, we do not torture. Could it be that he assumes the imperial we? If so, he may be correct. Individual people torture. And individual people kill and maim other people, destroy their homes and futures, shoot their livestock, topple their buildings. Perhaps the inanity of our troubled little Caesar is actually part of a larger plan to destroy the imperial mindset and restore the republic. It goes without saying that the rest of the world is wise to our existing empire, its financial and military incorporation, and its trite and transparent ideological propaganda. Our government likes to demonize those who have the temerity to speak honestly and publicly about our empire. We say Chavez is the new Castro, Putin is the new Stalin, Ahmadinejad the new Hitler. Some Americans and most non-Americans know enough about European, Soviet, and Cold War history to realize that Castro, Stalin, or Hitler, flavor of the month, is government propaganda directed specifically at a poorly educated American audience and at no one else. America's governmental mythology, Murray Rothbard referred to it as the carefully nurtured mystique of government, is being rejected around the world and by Americans themselves. This rejection is a beautiful thing, and it occurs daily, even minute by minute, at lewrockwell.com, antiwar.com, the Future Freedom Foundation, and a whole host of free market institutions, political movements, and organizations. It is especially wonderful to see the idea of global empire pummeled and gutted, usually unintentionally, in the pages of USA Today and the New York Times, to watch it on CNN and to listen via NPR when the very purveyors and beneficiaries of American empire and presumed hegemony inadvertently educate average Americans on the costs of empire and the truth of our imperial history, it is a very good thing and it signals the end of empire. Americans hear about nation building in Iraq and Afghanistan and they ask for it back home in storm and flood and fire ravaged cities in the south and the west and in the heartland. Americans hear about roads and bridges being constructed and repaired abroad and they'd like to see our tax dollars at home working on these exact same projects. Americans hear about the so-called security services our troops provide overseas, and they'd like to see that security applied at our ports and on our borders and even in our troubled urban areas. When Americans are told that they must wait for this kind of nation building and security at home because our economy is in a tailspin, our, our government is broke, and the two primary political parties have matching unconstitutional war agendas, they begin to understand the nature of centralized, unaccountable, lawless, imperial-minded government, and they inherently despise it. This is how crazy it is. A recent set of articles by Frida Bergen of the New America Foundation summarizes seven key missions assumed by the Pentagon under the current administration. These range from being America's intelligence agency, her domestic disaster manager, and by far the largest recipient of non-entitlement federal spending. They also include the roles of America's global diplomat, global arms de dealer, global humanitarian responder, and global viceroy of space in the heavens. It sounds surreal, unbelievable. It is a comedic parody of centralization of power, hubris, and incompetence. Augustine wrote The City of God in the early 400s, at a time of the late and undeniable collapse of the Roman Empire, which had been considered a Christian empire for nearly 200 years. Augustine wrote something that defines empire and clearly labels the hypocrisy that is its undoing. Many of you have probably heard or read this before, uh, but it's worth repeating here, and I'll quote from uh, Augustine. Without justice, what are kingdoms but great robber bands? What are robber bands but small kingdoms? The band is itself made up of men, is ruled by the command of a leader, is held together by a social pact. Plunder 
is divided in accordance with an agreed upon law. Is this, if this evil increases by the inclusion of dissolute men to the extent that it takes over territory, establishes headquarters, occupies cities, and subdues people, it publicly assumes the title of kingdom. And he goes on, a fitting and true response was once given to Alexander the Great by an apprehended pirate. When asked by the king what he thought he was doing by uh, infesting the sea, the pirate replied with noble insolence, what do you think you're doing by infesting the whole world? Because I do it with one puny boat, I am called a pirate. Because you do it with a great fleet, you are called an emperor. The American empire is collapsing. And as with the natural collapse of other empires, people in and out of the empire's grasp simply stop believing some decades and generations before the physical end. And this is where we are today. And unlike all previous empires in collapse, we live in an age of rapid communication and instant access to history, research, commentary, and imagery available for the asking. Tradition and habit can keep an empire on life support for centuries. At least it worked this way centuries before now. Today, change can come as quickly as ideas can travel, guide and inform individual choices and actions. We could identify many more signs of our collapsing empire, from professional expeditionary mercenary forces posing as a defense, to the absolute lack of real debate on the future of our fundamentally one-party governing establishment. There is a modern cliche that fits. It is what it is. Those Americans deeply invested in empire will face painful change. But at the same time, opportunities for freedom, for restrained Republican government, for prosperity and purpose exist. And they are available now for the rest of us. And remember, we are the majority. We can conceive of these opportunities on several levels. And in the next few minutes, I'd like to explore some specifics. Last year at this venue, I spoke of restoring the Republic. Some listeners were surprised when I veered around and passed the idea of a single massive Republic for this country and suggested uh, that a confederation of independent republics and states might work. This would reverse the Lincoln legacy, a sacrilege in Washington, but not a bad idea for the rest of the country. When we speak of empire, we speak of the taking and controlling of subordinate regions and people motivated by the economic interests of the politically connected and justified by a public ideology of patriotic and moral goodness. Certainly the Civil War could be described as the militarized policy to restrict the Southern capitalism that was squeezing Northern industrial and banking interests, energized by a widespread moral rationale that was leveraged, not shared, but leveraged by the political leaders. Subsequent imperial expansion and interventions from the Indian Wars the Hawaiian annexation, Spanish-American War, the U.S. involvement in the First and Second World Wars, and the 70-plus military interventions since then, including the ones we see in Afghanistan and Iraq, have all met this same criteria. When we speak of opportunities for restoring the public, we need to imagine a time in American government that we have not seen in 200 years. It is that Republican ideal that we should seek to restore, really small government weak and poorly nourished government. Government that approaches us rarely, and when it does, behaves like a friendly yet uncertain puppy. In my lifetime, the Libertarian Party has typically articulated this type of vision. But what is typically not articulated is the kind of person who creates this kind of small, benign government, thrives under it, the kind of person who resists feeding and entertaining the cute little puppy. Baby animals, as we all know, evolved to be cute, rounded, fuzzy, and submissive. Because cute, rounded, fuzzy, and submissive baby animals tend to get more positive attention from parents and others, and thus survive to make more creatures who, regardless of how obscenely frightening, monstrous, and aggressive they are destined to be when they grow up, are friendly and appealing in their infantile state. So it is with government. And this is an aspect of the Leviathan problem that defeats the wisest constitution. Government also grows and centralizes. Empires expand until they collapse because we the people want to be good, rich, and admired, but all on the cheap. 